Good morning, One Community Church. How is everybody doing uh, this morning? I wanted to come on real quick and give you guys just a, a quick update, and then I want to jump into uh, the message this morning. We're actually going to replay Reset Part 1. And the reason I'm going to do that today is because that message, man, that that's it. Like this, this series is where God has me. And uh, many of you know we had to break for COVID for two weeks, and... Um, you know, I don't want to stop the momentum that we have going. And this is, this is it. Message is it. Like, this is where God has me. I prayed. I was like, I was going to share something else with you guys this morning. But the Lord was like, no, that that's it. So we're going to replay that here in just a moment. But I do want to share a thought with you uh, real quick, if I could. Uh, comes comes from Luke chapter 24. And it's uh, verse 49. And this is Jesus talking before he would ascend back to heaven. And he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, talking about the Holy Spirit. But tarry, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. One translation says, clothed with power from on high. Now let's ease forward over to Acts chapter 1. And let's look here at verse 8. This is Jesus again talking before his ascension. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Guys, we have power. We have power. We have authority through the Holy Spirit, more power than we realize that we have. Uh, many of you know I had COVID. I Different people experience different levels of COVID. I, it was pretty tough for me. Uh, about two weeks there was was pretty tough, and especially uh, five five to six days of it was really hard. Uh, there was a night uh, that I believe was kind of the climax of it that I was really really sick, so sick that I thought that we may have to call nine one one. I was very ill, and I remember laying there contemplating. Should we call 911? And I just remember thinking to myself, before I call 911, I'm going to call 911 to Jesus. And I remember sitting up in the bed, sitting on the edge of the bed, with all the strength I had, I sit on the edge of the bed to myself, not out loud, but to myself. And I said, I have power. I have power and authority in the name of Jesus. And I began to claim that power, that Holy Ghost power. And I said, I am healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And I prayed that prayer, and I rebuked the enemy, and I rebuked sickness off of my life. And guys, within a matter of 10 to 15 minutes, I laid back down on the bed, and I went into the most peaceful sleep that I had slept in days. And I woke up, and from that moment forward, I began to feel better. Uh, wasn't overnight, it wasn't instantaneously, but I can honestly say I began to feel better. And it's because of the power that we have in Jesus. And I want to encourage you to tap into His power. There is power. The old song says, power, power, wonder-working power. And we have that power and authority. I believe we have more power and authority than we realize as believers. And we're living in a time where there's fear, there's worry. Everybody's scared of this virus. And, I, you know, I'm not scared of it, but I don't ever want it again. But, guys, this is the time. This We're living in those days. There's no question. We're living in those days, and it's time. It's It's time to to put up or shut up. It's time as believers where I believe he's separating the sheep from the goats. And either we tap into this power or we don't. We live in fear or we don't. And for me, I'm not going to live in fear. I, I'm not going to live in torment. I have power and authority in Christ Jesus. Yes, I want to be practical. Yes, I want to be wise. Yes, I want to follow protocols and do the necessary things I need to do to keep me and my family and my, our church congregation safe. But guys, we can't live in fear. We have to live in power. And the power is the person of the Holy Spirit. And He's given us that God-given power and authority. And we're living in those days. 
We're living in the last days. I believe that. This is the end of the end times. Guys, <clears throat> if the only word that you're getting is from Pastor Jay or from another preacher on Sunday morning or scattered here and there on social media, guys, you're not going to make it. I, I'm just being honest. you got to get in this book. you got to get in the pages of this book, not just on your phone, on your version app. And I love version. I use it from time to time. But guys, the problem with that is, is you're going to get a text, you're going to get an email, you're going to get sidetracked, but you need to put that, that thing away and you need to grab the book. Sometimes you're going to need, there's going to reach a time that you're going to need paper. You're going to need this book and you can't rely on other people. You've got to get in it and dig, it for, dig for yourself, especially in the day and the hour we live in. This is what's separating the sheep from the goats, those who can do it and those who can't. And so it's time to get in the book. It's time to dig deep. Don't just depend on Pastor Jay or whoever your pastor is to feed you all the time because who knows what's going to happen in our future. You, we've got to get rooted and grounded. And I encourage you to get in this book and tap into the power and authority that we have. We're fixing to play Reset Part 1. Also, Reset Part 2 is on our YouTube channel. And you can go in there, One Community Church Eldorado, make sure you put Eldorado in there and tap in. Uh, to our uh, YouTube page and our YouTube channel, I might say, and watch these sermons and watch Reset Part 2. Today, I'm actually preaching in on, on our uh, in camp, our own campus, on site, what I'm trying to say, service. I'm preaching Reset Part 3. It will be out online for online community next weekend. This will be Reset Part 3. So catch up during the week. Make sure you watch Reset 1, Reset 2, and get ready for Reset part three. I love you. Enjoy this message and we'll see you real soon. God bless you. Y'all ready for the message today? If you are, turn in your Bibles. You got your Bibles with you? I hope you have your Bibles with you today. I'm just going to pre-warn you in this new series that we're starting. You're going to need your Bible. You're going to need something to take notes with. We're going to give a lot of scripture. Uh, we will today, but especially next weekend. And so you want to be uh, prepared for that, and you want to bring something that you can take some notes and jot some things down uh, that you'll want to remember and be a part of. I'm also going to tell you <clears throat> to get ready for this, but um, there will be times that I will not give the media team the scriptures, okay? The reason I'm going to do that is because I want you to handle this book, Amen. okay? So I'm going to purposely at times not give them the scriptures, because I want you to bring your Bible and I want you to participate and turn to those pages with us. And I want you to handle this. This is the Word of God. I want you to handle it. I want you to know where these scriptures are. I want you to know where these books are. And so I'm not going to spoil you, okay? I'm, I want you to participate with us. So you'll need uh, your Bibles for this series and the series beyond this in the year of 2021. And... Uh, I want you to be a part of, of opening the scripture and handling the word of God uh, every single week and, and having a daily diet of this and knowing where these scriptures are. Genesis <clears throat> chapter 28, <clears throat> excuse me, Genesis chapter 28 is where I want to take my text today. Genesis chapter 28, right there in the first of the Bible in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse Number 10, when you get your place there, say amen. amen. <clears throat> now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it as at his head. In other words, he used it as a pillow. And he laid down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on earth. And its top reached to heaven. And there the angels, the angel of God, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be uh, as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then jo Jacob awoke from his sleep 
and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone that had, he had put under his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Everybody say Bethel. But the name of the city had been previously Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way, then I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothes to put on so that I can come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth of everything, one translation says. Today, I want to begin a very important series, at least for the next three weeks and possibly the entire month of January, and who knows, maybe even longer, called Reset Church. I want everybody to shout that out. Reset Church. Okay, that was kind of weak. Everybody say it. One, two, three. Reset Church. There you go. At the end of 2020, um, many of you know, uh, we took a, a sabbatical and took some time, and I'm so thankful for our leadership here at our church who recognized the importance of that for me and, and said, Pastor, get away and, and do what you need to do. And so we did, and the church has, was gracious, and, and we made it through that time. But that time was not just time off for me. It was not I was just twiddling my thumbs. It was the first time in almost three years that I had actually got away and was able to get rid of all the noise around me and I was able to just focus on God, and I was able to say, God, what do you want to do at One Community Church? What, what do you want to do? What, what is it that you have for this church? And I was able to get fresh vision and fresh revelation, and I love those times and, and pray that we can have those times periodically ever so often. But in that time that I was off, God really began to speak to me, and as many of you know the story of our church, our church is is uh, going into its third year, so it's, it's, a, it's a young church. However, it was two churches that merged together in the year of 2018, so we're not just a fly-by-night church. We have longevity, but we're also a new church. We're not a church plant, per se, but we are a, a new church. And so in the three years, or not three years, but soon to be three years, this is going into our third year. In the, the first two and a half years, I guess you would say, with the merger and all that happened, many of you know the story. We were larger than our buildings. Uh, we had to, to rent venues to meet in, and there were several moves that we had. Then we bought this 90,000 square foot complex and renovated this room and the rooms adjacent to this room. And, and those two years were just fast and furious. I mean, it was just constant for me. It, there was, I, I, you know, sermon prep, you'd have to be a pastor to understand how much time it takes and the hours of preparation that it takes to, to do a sermon or a series even. And so there was just so much happening. I felt like I grabbed a hold of a, of a moving locomotive. I mean, it was just so fast. It was just so fast, so furious. And there was so much that was happening that I just didn't really, I mean, I was just being pulled from every direction and, and uh, it was all new to me. I'd never pastored a church this large. And so it, it really caught me by surprise. And, and there was so much happening and so many voices in my, in my ears. And we need to do this and we need to do that. And, and it was all of this stuff. And, it, and just sometime I just wanted to hold my ears and go, stop. There was just so much that was going on. And so through that time, it was just really so much happening that when January 2020 happened, I was so thankful because I finally felt like in January and February of last year, whew, maybe I could take a deep breath and maybe, just maybe, we can start gaining spiritual momentum, which was what I was looking forward to. I love the buildings and the moves and all the frou-frou, that's all great, but I was looking forward to really gaining momentum spiritually. And guess what? January and February happened, and guess what happened in the month of March 2020? Good old COVID happened. And when that happened, I'm telling you, I had never pastored through a pandemic. So I've got all these first things happening to me in two years' time. So here I am pastoring through a global pandemic, being online. We had plans to be online, but we did not have the equipment for it or the budget for it or any of that stuff. I mean, it was just, it caught us by surprise. 
And so here I am learning all this new stuff, and all of this stuff is just, is just happening. And it almost felt like to me through the last two and a half years, it was like we'd start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And it was just exhausting. You know what I'm saying? It just it, it exhausted you. And so that was what was going on, and I, I was hoping and praying we would gain the momentum, and then COVID happened, and then you start, and you stop, and you start the momentum. Even starting this year, we've got, as I told you at the onslaught, there's so many people out, either due to COVID or, or been around, exposed to somebody with COVID, so they're quarantined, which is great. We, we recommend that. But it, it just feels like, man, every time you start to get somewhere, something else happens. And so what I really feel like is the Lord laid on my heart in, in the, end of, the end of 2020, in the fall months, that God said, I want you just to reset. And that was really what the sabbatical was all about. It was just about resetting. How many of you know sometimes you just need a good, hard reset? And so we just reset as a family we, and as, a, as an individual. I just reset. And we just kind of, I love the graphic here because of the papers that are just wadded up. In other words, we make our plans, the Bible says, we, we make our plans, but God sometimes has other plans. Am I right? And so I just kind of wadded up every plan I ever had and said, you know what? I'm just going to start over. I just want to start from scratch, and I just want to start over, and I just want to have a reset. And so that's where this sermon was birthed, and this series was birthed. And one thing that I love that has happened over the last month that I see happening in this church, I finally feel momentum. I finally feel what I've been longing for for two years. I feel it. I feel unity. I do. I feel unity in this house that I haven't felt, that I feel now. And I am so thankful for that. I've prayed for that for so long. And I feel like we are starting to gain some ground and momentum. And one thing that I love about a reset and a fresh start is that it can be pure. It can be very pure. And I think, I think that depends on us. If we're going to start this pure and we're going to keep it pure, listen to me, there can't be any agendas. Amen. There just can't be. There can't be any cliques. How many of you know a lot of churches have cliques? Yeah. I do not want this to be the first church of cliques. Amen. I don't want any cliques here. The only click we have is Jesus. And so it can't be any agendas, there can't be any clicks, there can't be any big I's or little U's. Okay, we're all on the same playing field. The, the ground at the cross is level. We're all in the same boat. So we, we're all starting with the same place. We, we all come to Him by grace. Amen? Amen? So there's no big I's and little U's. We're, we're all here, listen to me, we're all here for one purpose and one purpose only. And it's not to decide the color of the carpet. It's not to decide the color of the walls or what the layout's going to look like. We're here for one reason, one reason only, period, and that's to worship God. Amen. That's it. That's the only reason we're here is to worship God. That is the whole reason and premise behind church. May we never get agendas or become political inside of this house. May we never get agendas and become political or, here's another word, self-centered. Where it's all about us, where the focus is all on us. So when you begin a church or you plan a church or you merge a church like we did, there's all these questions that you've got to answer. And a lot of these questions just came in floods and waves toward us. And questions like, who are we? What are we here for? Questions like, does El Dorado just need another church? And in my opinion, no, I don't think we need another church. We've got a lot of churches in El Dorado. And so there's all these questions that you've got to answer. Who are we? The who, the what, the why? You've all heard that. That's so important. It is important. But to me, there's a greater question that we left out. There's a greater question, more than the who, more than the why and the what and all of that. There's a question to me that is more important. And it's a greater question. And the question is, the main question is, first of all, I think if we're going to have a reset, we've got to define first, what is church? Before we can answer any other question, the who, the what, and the why, we've got to answer, what is church? Everybody say, what is church? So, this is what I do. This is 
what I've done all my life. I've been a part of pastoral ministry in some way, grew up in it, having parents that are pastors. I've watched churches my entire life. I'm a very observant person. I observe things and people, and I've always been observant, and I've observed through the years. I've watched the church as a, as a whole through the years of growing up in church, and I've watched the different, I'm going to use this word, fads that have come through church, and I've watched that, and I've, I've experienced that. I jumped into that, and I, I've watched, I've observed, I've, I've participated, and I've looked at churches even today. I've, I've looked, I've studied over the last few churches, doing a merger like we've done, doing all the things that we've done. I've, I've watched other people, I've gleaned from other people. What are they doing? How are they doing? And all of that. And Great churches by the world standards and by church cultural standards, these are great churches. Now, I don't minimize anything these churches are doing. They're doing outstanding things for the Lord. But I do have a question. As I look at the church today, as I look at the church as a whole, my question is, are they churches or are they entertainment venues? Are these churches or are they entertainment venues? Church to me has become like the Christian movie theater. <clears throat> we come to church to be entertained. Now I want to say something and I think it's very good. It's funny, but it's good. We've reduced church to big screens, skinny jeans, and smoke machines. <laughs> That's what we've done to church. Big screens, skinny jeans, and smoke machines. Now, I want to preface, I want to say something. I am not against big screens. We have three of them behind me. Okay? I am against skinny jeans for me. <laughs> if you want to wear them, that's your prerogative. Not me. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I would tell you a joke, but it would not be appropriate. <laughs> so, uh, I want to say something. Y'all got me sidetracked. I am not against any of those things. But I am against those things if they're used out of context. So I'm not against them, but what I am against is the entertainment aspect. When people come to church to spectate and not engage. You're just a spectator. I said it a moment ago, you're consumers, not contributors. I'm against that. Totally against that. And that's what's happening in church today. If we're really doing church God's way, the building doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. These tools, these are tools, these screens, these lights, all of these, these are tools, okay? That's all this is. Now, I want to say something about these tools. I believe in the tools because the tools have a purpose. The building has a purpose. The screens have a purpose. The lights have a purpose. All of it has a purpose, the purpose is to attract people, the Great Commission. We're, we're called to reach people for Christ. So if any of these things, these frilly things, if they attract someone to our church or attract your attention long enough for us to minister to you, then praise God, glory, hallelujah. Amen? Amen? But let me say something. All of these tools may attract people, but they won't keep people. They will not keep people. They may attract them, but they won't keep them. The only thing that will keep people is an encounter with God. That's it. That's the only way to have any sustainability is to have an encounter with God. That is the goal of One Community Church. I believe God is going to use this church in this county, in this city, in this region, and even beyond. I believe that with all of my heart. But it's going to happen when people come and have an encounter with God. And they experience God. So over the next couple of weeks, for sure, in this series, I want to answer some questions. And today we're going to answer one question. And that question is, what is church? What is church? I, I would dare to say if I polled this room, we would have all kinds of answers. All kinds of answers of what church is. So let's think about this. Jake, uh, Genesis 28, Jacob is, is the main character in this story. Jacob was on his way from Beersheba to Haran, running for his life. He was a deceiver, a person you and I would consider to be a worthless liar. He goes to sleep in a place called Luz. He goes to sleep, has this dream of angels ascending and descending, wakes up and Jacob says, God was in this place and I didn't know it. That's sad. 
that you can be in a place that God is at and you not be aware of it. So what is church? So I want to give you three points. Everybody shout out three points. Here's the first one. Number one, church is a connection. Everybody shout out church is a connection. Genesis 28 verse 12. It was about a divine connection with heaven. If the only reason you come to church is to be entertained and hear and see the coolest music, the greatest technology, and professional, shiny, put-together people and hear a sermonette, you've missed the whole reason for church. Amen. We have missed what church is really about. Church is about a divine connection with God. It is about a divine connection with God. An open heaven over this place where spiritual things are ascending and descending into our lives. That's my heart for this church, for one community. That angels would ascend and descend in our midst and that we would have an encounter with God. Church is not about political clout, although I think political clout will come. I think our church will have influence. I think churches need to have influence in their community. I think political clout will come. But church is not about political clout. Church is not about the most beautiful building, although they may, that may come at some point. But my heart is, if we're here, or we're in a barn, or we're in a pup tent, doesn't matter where we are, God, I want you to open up heaven over this place, and I want angels to ascend and descend in our midst, and I want us to have an encounter with the God of the universe. That's what church is. That's it. Shut the book, drop the mic, let's go home. That's church. John chapter 1 verse 51. Jesus is talking to Nathaniel in this story. Nathaniel was a Jew. Jews know about the story we just read in Genesis 28. They call it Jacob's the story of Jacob's ladder. So they're very all the Jews are very familiar with Genesis 28. Jesus said, you're going to see heaven open over me, Nathaniel, and angels ascending and descending upon me. Jesus is saying, you've heard of Jacob's ladder, Nathaniel. I'm the ladder. And you know how we get supernatural things in our midst? We get Jesus in our midst. Spiritual things. When you get Jesus in your midst, spiritual things begin to happen. And that's the goal, that we want Jesus to be in our midst. Genesis chapter 28, verse 19. He named the place, remember Jacob, when he woke up, he named the place Bethel. Bethel. What does Bethel mean? Bethel means the house of God. Everybody shout out the house of God. So let's, let's, let's ask this question. What makes it the house of God? I know, I know, it's the lights. I know what it is. It's the steeple. The steeple makes it the house of God. I know what it is. It's the cross, the crucifix. That's what makes it a church, right? I got so amused. We were a church for years without a steeple. Then we moved to another location that was already a previous church, and we got a steeple. And the minute we got a steeple, it was like everybody in El Dorado finally admitted we were a church. I'm like, man, we've been a church for years. But now we got a steeple. It's official. So is church the steeple? No. I know what church is. It's the pastor and his personality. No. No. no, that's not the church. Lord, help us if that's the case. <laughs> that's not the church. There's only one thing that makes it the house of God, and that is Jesus is here and his presence is here. Amen. And that's what makes this the house of God. What we do here can't be about you or me and entertaining us, and listen to me, it cannot be about entertaining us, and it can't be about satisfying us. Amen. What we do here is not about you or me. Now I'm going to say something that's going to shock a lot of people. This is going to be shocking all. You ready? This is going to shock so many people. Church is not about ministering to you. It's not. Now that's a secondary consequence of the presence of God in this place, but church is not even about ministering to you. You're not, we're not here to minister to you, but we're here to minister to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, build, a, build a seat so He can come down and be a throne in our midst so supernatural things can start happening. 
That's why we come to church. Not for you, not for me, but for Him. We're ministering to Him. That's the whole purpose. This place is holy, man. We don't come in here just any old way with any old attitude. This place is holy. What makes it holy? The presence of God is here. Man, that's why our worship team, and I know I'm probably not their favorite character because, you know what? I challenge our worship team. Man, we're going to live this life. Because when you stand up here, it's holy. You don't just walk up here any old way. You don't just stand up here and do what you want to do. No, it's holy to God. This is a holy place. We got to get the holiness back in church. We got to get reverence back in church where this is the house of God, and that means something. Well, you don't just throw down litter on the sidewalks or in the grass. This is the house of God. This is not Kentucky Fried Chicken or Chickadilly. Don't throw chicken bones everywhere. If you're watching, don't throw chicken bones in our parking lot. This place is holy. Everybody shout out holy. Holy. I didn't mean to get to the chicken bone part. (laughs) But this is a place so God can come down. We're we're making a place that God can come down and be enthroned. And supernatural things can happen. That's what it's about. This is what church is. And the Lord can be in a place and you not know it. If you go to a place and the Lord is there and you're not aware of it, don't blame it on the church because the Lord is everywhere and the Lord can be there. Jacob said, I didn't know it, but I love what he said, but I do now. I do now. It is dangerous to come to church and not realize God is in this place. And if you don't know God is here, you need to know. And and he wants to do, listen, he wants to do supernatural things in your life. So number one, church is a... Three people know it. Church is a what? Come on, guys. Y'all can do better than that. Church is a... This side is not doing very good. Church is a connection. So number one, you connect with God. God starts talking to you. There should never be a time you come to this place and God doesn't speak to you at some level. This is about you having a divine connection with God. I want people to walk in here and be smitten by the presence of God. I cannot wait to preach the third message of the series to you. But I want people to be smitten by the presence of God. Where they're like, man, God was in that place. I've had people leave here and and back before COVID when I could stand out and greet people, people would come and say, I had one guy come to me one day and he said, man, I don't know what's in that place, but something is, he said, I had chills running all over me. I said, man, that was the presence of God. That's what that is. That's not me. That's not the music. That's God. That's his presence. And that's the goal, church. Amen. So it's about God. It's a connection with God. I want people to come here and be smitten by the presence of God. I want people to drive by one community church and feel God. What would it be like for somebody just to drive by and the Lord say, turn in, and they pulled in our parking lot one morning and come in here and gave their life to Jesus. I believe the presence of God can be that strong and that real on a place. I want downtown El Dorado, Murphy Art District to know one community is right here. I want El Dorado to know one community is here. And they're not going to know one community is here because we got a cool worship center. They're not going to know one community is here because the pastor can communicate. They're they're not going to know it. They're going to know we're here by one reason and one reason only, and that is the presence of God is here. And you can come here and have an encounter with God. So it's a divine connection with God, but then it's also a divine connection with people. That's what church is. You come to connect with people. That's why I hate COVID. And I love online. I think it's great. It's, it's a great substitute, but it'll never take the place of being here corporately together. It just won't. And I know we got the protocol and we need to do the protocols. But guys, there's something about rubbing shoulders and elbows with the family of God. There's something about worshiping God with other people that happens. So when you come here, you make a divine connection with God. Then you make a divine connection with people. And I think about all of the connections across this room and even those that are not with us today. I was thinking mostly so many of them, unfortunately, are not with us today. I was thinking about all the connections that are here in this room that have been made through the years. Think about... Steve and Lisa White sitting here. I I had the opportunity to marry them. 
uh, to officiate their wedding. And then now they got a little boy, Brandon. And I've seen God do so many things in their life. Why? You got connected to church. Do you regret connecting to church? You connected with church and you connected with people. Mike and Lisa Allison back here. Mike, God, I, I've been praying for you. God is doing something in you. I see God doing something in you, brother. I can't even, I don't, I can't even articulate it, but I've been praying for you. You've been before my face, and I'm telling you, there's something about you guys. There's a connection. Aren't you glad you connected? Look around this room, Jason and Megan. She came here our first Sunday at the conference center. I mean, I'm glad you came, and you loved it. It was a horrible day for me, but you came and loved it. It was so much going on. We're trying to do everything, but you came and connected. You connected with God. You connected with people. Now your family's in church. What connected you? Another family in our church, the Alberts. Do you see how that works? Deanna and Dennis Jerry, they, they're such a blessing. We connected. And because of those relationships, now we're connected to other people. Do y'all see how this works? I had somebody come uh, to church the other day, come to the office, and they were wanting uh, help. And that happens pretty frequently. And I told that person, I said, look, so we can help you a little bit with some mon monetary things to help meet your monetary needs. But listen, you need to come to church because they were saying, I can't find a job. I, I've looked all over the place. I can't find a job and this and that. And they gave their story. And I said, listen, if you'll come to church, God's going to start connecting with you. You're going to start connecting with God. You're going to start connecting with people because of divine connections. And God's going to hook you up with a job. See how this works? They still haven't come. Because they don't understand. But I'm telling you, something happens when we connect with God and we begin to connect with other people. And I see so many people that, that start connecting. They start that connection and then all of a sudden they pull the connection. And God, I mean, they were just on the verge of something happening and they, they disconnect. Listen, we've got to connect. Everybody say connect to God, connect to people. When you connect with God, God turns around and connects you with the right people. And that's what church is all about. That's what, that's what church is. Write this down. This is what church is not. If you're taking notes, write this down. I'm going to drive this point home. If I don't get anything across today, I want to get this point across. Write this down. This is what church is not. Church is not Christian entertainment. If you're only coming because whoever's preaching that day, you're missing church. Whether I'm preaching or so, well, pastor's not preaching today, so I'm just not going to come. No, no, you come because you're connecting with God and people, not with a man. So we come to church to connect with God and connect with people. Church is not Christian entertainment. If we could write a definition of church, it would be, it would be this. Becoming aware of the presence of God. Becoming aware of the presence of God. He was in this place and I didn't know it, but praise God, I do now. So number one, church is a... Church is a what? Here's number two. Church is a conversation. Everybody shout out church is a conversation. Exodus 25, 22. This is the promise God made to Moses. You build me a house. You build me a tabernacle. And there I will meet with you and I will speak with you. In other words, you build me a church. You build me a place. And when you get it built, I'm going to come down and we're going to talk. That's what God said. So church is a connection, but it's also a divine conversation. When you go to church, God should be talking to you. And if he's not, something is wrong. God is talking all the time. He talks so much, he's called the word. God is talking and he wants to talk to you. So what I do up here is called preaching. The Bible calls it the foolishness of preaching. Notice he didn't say foolish preaching. He said the foolishness of preaching. Preaching should be skillful. I've heard some people preach they have no business preaching. <laughs> preaching is skillful. It's a gift. We're going to talk about that next weekend. It's a gift. But, but it's, it, the Bible calls it the foolishness of preaching. And the reason that it says that is because what's happening now and what happens on every weekend is I'm up here and I'm communicating one thing and the Holy Spirit can com be communicating a hundred different things to a hundred different people all at the same time while I'm communicating one thing. Do you see how that works? That's why you come to church because He's always talking. 
And He's talking to you. Whatever level you're at, He's having a conversation. That's church. You come to church to have a conversation with God. And God talks to you and you talk to God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. That's what church is. My prayer is every time you leave this place, you will walk out of here, go to your car and say, man, God talked to me today. God spoke to me today. Now there's three ways that God talks to His church And I want to preface these three ways by saying none of them are bad. Okay, and I'm going to say that because of number one. Three ways God talks to his church. Number one, through correction. Everybody shout out correction. I have a lot of people that tell me, Pastor, when I go to your church, I have to wear my steel toe boots. Because you step all over my toes. Well, I don't. I've had people accuse me of having video cameras, Maddie, in their homes. Pastor, you've been in my home, you've been, you got that video camera in my house because it seems like every Sunday you preach on whatever's happening in my house. Well, how many of you know, I don't know what's going on in her house, but the Holy Spirit knows what's going on in her house. What is that? That's a conversation. You're having a divine conversation in your spirit with God as I'm preaching. That's what's happening with the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? So sometimes God corrects you and he steps on your toes and you go, ow, that hurt. Right? So it's about correction. This is the way God speaks. Correction, direction, and inspiration. Those three things. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 talks about prophecy and it says prophecy, if they throw that up there, prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, if they could put that up there, it says the word of God, all scripture, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction. So when God talks to you and me, he always talks in one of these three dimensions, correction, direction, and inspiration. Everybody shout it out. Correction, direction, and inspiration. Those are the three ways God talks to you. That's the conversation that God's having with you. Let me give you an example. If I'm a stranger to El Dorado and I pulled up in a parking lot and you could see that I was confused and didn't know where I was the days before GPSs and you saw I had out of town plates and you were standing there talking to someone and I'm and you're close by my car and you say, hey man, can I help you? And I say, yes, you can help me. I'm on my trying to find I'm on my way to the municipal auditorium. Can you help me get there? And you say, yes, I can, but you're headed in the wrong direction. You're headed toward Magnolia. You need to make a U-turn and you need to turn around if you want to go to the municipal auditorium. How many of you know you just corrected my direction? How many of you know you just saved me from the wrong destination? See, when we come to church, oftentimes that's what's happening through me or through worship or through someone else. God says, hold up, you're going the wrong way. Let me ask you, what have you missed that weekend where God was telling you you're going the wrong way? What have you missed that weekend and you went the wrong way and you got there and it was a dead end? After years of traveling. I've had that happen. I've seen it so many times as a pastor. It's really frustrating, but there's not much I can do about it. But it's very frustrating because I cannot count how many times God gave me a word that was so strong and I knew it was for somebody and that, that person was not there. I didn't know who the person was, but that person was not there. Only to find about two days into the next week, that person was, is going to go through everything I preached on Sunday, and they missed Sunday. See, God set up a divine conversation for them, and they missed it. Amen, church? And so that's what happens. Church is a divine conversation. It's correction. We're going the wrong way. We don't need to look at the conversation of correction as a bad thing because you never get to the right destination going the wrong way. Can I hear an amen? The next next aspect is direction. So if I'm heading the right direction and you say, hey man, same scenario, I'm in the parking lot and you say, hey man, you're going toward the municipal auditorium, but you need to take the next right. How many of you know that's not correction, that's direction? Amen? Amen. Sometimes you come to church, God wants, to take, wants you to take a U-turn, and sometimes He wants to say, you're real close, but you need to go down here and take a right or left. That's a divine conversation. But then there's an aspect we all love, and that's called inspiration. 
we all want to come to church and somebody fire us up. So if I'm coming from out of town and I'm trying to get to Municipal Auditorium and I'm on empty, my gas tank is on empty, then how many of you know I need some fuel? So here's what I want to happen. When I go to church, number one, I want to have a divine connection, but I also want to have a divine conversation. Hey, you're going the wrong way. You need better directions. Or sometimes we're just broken, busted, and disgusted, and we're running on empty. Have you ever been there? Where you just needed some inspiration. That's church. I feel like the old school uh, gas station attendant. Y'all remember the old gas stations? You pulled up there and there was an attendant. And they would wash your windshield and check the air pressure on your tires and check your oil. And all the whole time they're pumping gas and you never even had to get out of your car. Well, that's what ministry is. That's my job. That's what I'm doing. I'm cleaning your windshield so you can see a little better. I'm putting a little premium in your tank. That's what church is. To get you to your destination. Can I hear an amen? amen? So number one, church is a connection. Number two, church is a what? Church is a what? Church is a connection and then church is a conver- conversation. Here's the last one. Are y'all ready? Don't cringe when I say it. Because y'all are going to love it. Here's the last one, number three. Church is number one, a connection, a conversation. And number three, church is a commitment. Three amens and one so good. (laughs) Thank y'all for that. uh, Genesis 28, 20, Jacob wakes up and says, I made a vow to God. So church is a commitment. Everybody say a commitment. Look at me and look at me real close. Read my lips. (laughs) Pastor Jay cannot do everything in this church. I can't. I'm not physically able to do everything in this church. And in our church culture, in the Bible Belt, in South Arkansas, here's the mentality, and this culture has, this has to change. We get a pastor, and he's really not a pastor, he's a preacher. We don't want a pastor. We want a preacher. Okay? Because there's a big difference between the two. I don't want to just be a preacher. I want to be your pastor. Okay? And in South Arkansas, in the Bible Belt, in this community and, and, and beyond, in this religious type culture, you hire, keyword, you hire a pastor or a preacher. Let, let's correct that. You hire a preacher. You hire him to do your work. That's what you think. But you haven't read the Bible because you don't hire a preacher to do your work. You're to do the work. The pastor is to equip you to do the work. You're doing ministry. Not me. You are. I'm here for correction, direction, and inspiration. You're here to go out and minister. You're here to make hospital visits. You're here to visit the funeral homes. You're here to pray for people on the phone. You're here to pray and lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. That's your job. That's you, not me, you. So we have this mentality, the preacher does every single thing. He does it all. He's the first person at church. He's the last person to leave. He turns the lights on, turns the lights off, turns the heat and air on. And uh, if something breaks, he he breaks, he fixes it on his way out. And then if he ever has time, then he studies. That's what we've reduced church to. But I want to tell you, we cannot do church by ourselves. I cannot do church by myself. I cannot do everything. Every week we need guest service team members. We need ushers and ushettes. We need friendly people. Look back there at that sound booth. It takes five or six people back there to run all of that technology. We need people. We cannot do this on our own. If this church is going to succeed, it's going to take every single one of us. Every single one of us. And you can't say, well, I just don't know. I don't have time. You can't do that. you got to say like Jacob, I make a vow to you. I commit to you. This is the house of God. This is the house of God. And I'm going to commit to this house of God. Right now on our serve team, we have about 80 people serving right now. And that's a great number. But I'm believing God. My goal, by the end of 2021, there will be over 100 people on serve teams in this church. And there's no reason why that can't happen. Come on, church. Give the Lord a hand clap. 
There's no reason why that can't happen. So y'all know I was going to get there when the minute I said commitment, you knew it was coming. So let's go ahead and knock it out of the way for 2021. Y'all ready? Lisa said, come on. Commitment. Everybody say commitment. Giving. Giving. You knew it was coming. We got to give. We got to be committed. Genesis 28, 20. I will give. Jacob said when he woke up and he made that vow to God, he said, I will give you a tenth of everything. I will give you a tenth. We call it a tithe. Genesis 31, 13. I am the God of Bethel where you made the vow to me. In other words, I noticed when you made the commitment to me, not just came and enjoyed the ladder coming up and down. God said, Jacob, when you made the commitment, I took notice. That's what this verse is saying. When you made a commitment, I paid attention. Not when you just come to church. The devil don't mind you coming to church. He don't mind you coming to church as long as church don't get in you. He don't mind you coming and just flirting with it and enjoying it and being entertained a little bit. He's fine with that. But when you get committed, come on church, then the ball game changes and the ball game shifted. If we're going to do something great, it's going to take all of us. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, I didn't say this, Jesus said it, where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Jesus said that. Let me ask you a question, and I'm closing. Pastor Daniel, just come up and play. If you went tomorrow morning and you bought $500,000, half a million dollars worth of Apple stock, what would you be doing on Tuesday? You'd be looking at that stock. If you bought $500,000 worth of Apple stock, what would you be doing on Wednesday? Looking at that stock. Here's the principle. Wherever you're committed, you're invested. You look after it. The reason people come to church but aren't committed to church is because they come to church to be entertained. Church is not just about experiencing God. Listen to me. Church, this is so good you ought to write. This is such a good nugget. Church is not just about experiencing God but exhibiting God. Okay? It's not just about coming and, and, and experiencing it. I'm going to exhibit God in everything that I do. How do we do that? By being committed. So church is a number one connection. connection number two. And number three. So let's say that again. Number one. Number two. Number three. Commitment. Genesis 32, 28. Look at what happens when Jacob had a connection, had a conversation, and made a commitment. This is God talking to Jacob. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, which means liar, cheater, deceiver, but you will be called Israel, for you have struggled with God and man and have prevailed. Watch this. You have struggled with God and with man, and you have prevailed. So Jacob got a connection, he got a conversation, he got committed, and then he struggled. And I like to say to all of the people who join our church or you, or you um, give your life to Jesus and you start committing here and, and that connection and conversation happens and then you commit here and you join up with us. When those three things start happening, I always tell people, and I just want to warn you today, if you do that, get ready for the struggle. Amen. Get ready for the struggle because the devil's going to hit you with both barrels. The Bible says he comes immediately to take away the word. Because he don't want to see you have, have he don't want to see you uh, get he don't want to see you have a connection he don't want to see you get a conversation and he don't want to see you get committed those three C's are hard to say but he don't want to see that in your life and so I just want to warn you he's going to attack you and it is the proof that what you're doing is real so when you get attacked when it gets hard and it does and I see so many people they start struggling things start happening man I gave my life to the Lord I thought it was going to be a piece of cake rainbows ice cream and lollipops but then there's a struggle there's a struggle that starts happening why the devil don't want you to get connected he don't want you to have a conversation and he don't want you to commit come on so Jacob got this connection, he got, had a conversation, he got committed, and then he struggled. But Jacob said, there's the key, here's the key, here's the key. Listen to me. He said, but I'm not letting you go. 
until you bless me. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in. I'm not going to quit until you bless me. We got to get that quitter mentality out of our head. We don't quit when it gets hard. We don't give up. Come on, church. We say, Lord, I am not letting go. I'm going to hold on until you bless me. And Jacob walked away with a limp. He had a mark on him. I'm going to tell you, sometimes serving God, it, it'll leave a mark on you. Amen. It'll leave a mark on you. But Jacob said, I'm not letting you go. What if we showed up every week and said, Lord, I'm not leaving here until I connect with you, until I have a conversation with you, and I respond in some way. We have a choice. We can do the church entertainment deal. And I'm just going to tell you, if we're going to do the church entertainment deal, I'm out. Amen. I'm not your guy. If you want an entertainer, if you want a system, I'm not your guy. But if you want to experience God and you want to have a connection and you want to have a conversation and a commitment, I'm your guy all the way. Where we come in here and we experience God. Come on, stand to your feet. You've been a good audience. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, I thank you today for this word. I thank you, Father, that as we start this New Year's, we reset Resets are hard. That's why they call them hard resets. Because they're hard. And so today, Lord, we, we embrace the hard. We embrace the pushback. Because, Lord, we got a greater goal ahead of us. And, Lord, like Jacob, we're not going to let you go till you bless us. Father, we want people to come in here and have a connection, a conversation, and be committed we want them to not just come encounter, encounter you to encounter you, and that will happen, but we want them to exhibit you, to leave this place exhibiting you, not just encountering you, but exhibiting you in their life, that their life looks like that. Their life looks like the encounter that they just had. Father, I thank you that right now you're doing that in this church. You're doing that in this place. Father, I believe the day that maybe there's somebody here in this room or even watching online digitally that needs to make a commitment to you today. So Father, today, if there's anybody in this room or watching, that God, they would make that commitment to you. They would give their life to Jesus. And they would start fresh and anew in 2021. They'd get committed. They'd get committed. Not just flirt with the idea or just do it for a little while to start their year and fizzle out. But Lord, they would commit wholeheartedly. Whether it's this church or another church, they would commit. They would make up their mind. This is, the, my, this is my church. This is where I have that, that conversation and connection with God and with people. And this is where I commit. Father, I thank you right now. If you're here in this room with heads bowed and eyes closed and you say, Pastor Jay, I want to make that commitment. I want to break, start 2021 off right. I want to make a commitment to God. Is there anybody in this room that would want to do that? Simply lift up your hand and just acknowledge that. I want to make God the God of my life in 2021. Thank you for hands. Thank you. I see that hand. God sees that hand. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I just want, as my family and as just personally, I just want 2021. I want to make that commitment to God in 2021. I'm tired of being on the fringes. I'm tired of being on the fence. And I want to make a commitment this year to jump in with all I've got and not let go. If that's you, slip up your hand. Come on, if that's you. Hands are going up. I want to commit. God, I want to commit. Thank you for those hands. That should be everybody in this room. Come on, lift those hands. Lift those hands to heaven. Father, thank you for every single hand. I think that's all of us. All of us, if we're honest, we would say, God, I want to commit to you. I want to commit to you. I don't want to, be a, I don't want to just straddle the fence. I want to commit to you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the decisions that were just made in this place and online. God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Come on, can we give the Lord a big hand clap? Come on, thank you. God is so good. God is so good. He is so good. Well, thank you for coming to the house of the Lord today. We'll continue this topic next weekend. Got some awesome things um, in store for you. Next weekend, we're going to answer the question, why church? Why do you come to church? What is the purpose of church to begin? Why? 
Why do you even come? We're going to talk about that. We're going to get real honest and talk about why we come to church. And so it's going to be really good as we start this new year and this new series off Reset Church. Everybody shout it out. Reset Church. Let's do this thing and let's see God do amazing things in 2021. Well, guys, if you're here today and you're visiting with us, your first time ever at One Community Church, we're so glad that you're here. If you'll look in the seat in front of you, there is um, I'm New Here cards. If you would fill that card out and take it either to our north entrance, which is right out this door, or our west entrance, depending on what side you, of the buildings uh, you parked on, uh, there is what we call a welcome desk. You can see those desks there. You turn those cards in or drop them in our offering boxes. Uh, but please go turn those cards in. The purpose for that is if you turn that card in, we have a free gift that we'd like to put in your hands and just thank you uh, for being a part of our service today. Well, like always, we're going to close our service today with giving. Now, I said this a moment ago. I want to say it again for clarity. Giving is not just money and a budget. It is not just um, money and an offering plate. Money is worship. And so we give to worship, amen? We worship God through our substance, and so we want to give today as we exit the building. There's offering boxes on each side of the door. Also, you can give online at communityeldo.com, and those are the ways that you can give uh, to our church. I want to make...